Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Dan Mencia, I, uh, professor of creative writing in the English department, and I'm a member of the Contemporary Writers Series Committee. So welcome everyone to our final event of this season, our 24th season. Um, of course, it's been an unusual one. We've, we've done these events virtually, and I think they've all gone really well. And um, they've gotten better and better over the course of the year. And I have to, part of that, I'm sure, is our, like we were just talking about, our comfort with the technology. Um, I was thinking about this earlier today, how, how the, word, the buzzword that I hear from faculty, staff, students, is resilient. And I think the series has been quite resilient this past year. And I am really grateful for that, for the, the student participation, for our writers, for the committee members, for, uh, for you know, Shelly, our uh, director, and uh, Linda, our patron. So thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, so yeah, look, looking forward to this, looking forward to our 25th season next year. So if you're, you'll, you will, hopefully these are, you know, we'll, I don't know for sure if we're gonna be in person or not, hopefully they are, so fingers crossed. Um, so watch for that. Um, so I will ask if you are uh, viewing this, if you haven't already, um, please mute your mics. Um, we'll do a Q&A session at the end of the reading uh, and with, I think Dr. Rumer will be facilitating that. So then obviously you'll be able to turn your mics back on and ask questions. So welcome, welcome to uh, Dr. Uh, Tracy Brimall to our reading for this evening. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jaden Jones with our introduction. Thank you, Dr. Mencia. So good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Jaden Jones, and I am the upcoming student representative um, for the Contemporary Writer Series beginning this fall. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing to you our final writer of the 2020-21 season, Tracy Brimall. She is the author of four poetry collections, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod, Saudade, our Lady of the Ruins, and Rookery. She's also co-written two chapbooks with Bryn Sato, Bright Power, Dark Peace, and Wild Recovery, as well as an illustrated crown of sonnets entitled The Wrong Side of Rapture, which she wrote with Aaron Cruft. Her inventive lyricism won her a place in Best American Poetry 2014, edited by Terrence Hayes, a national endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship in Poetry in 2013, and various scholarships and fellowships to the CUNY Writers Conference, the Writers Center of, Be of Bethesda, Vermont Studio Center, the Disquiet International Literary Program, and the Arctic Circle Residency. She received her BA from Florida State University, her MFA from Sarah Lawrence College, and her PhD from West Michigan University. She is currently the Associate Professor and Director of Creative Writing at Kansas State University. Set in the middle of an apocalypse, Our Lady of the Ruins follows a group of women who remain resilient amidst total chaos. The language is hyper-imaginative, deftly incorporating themes of religion, sacrifice, and oblivion. It is the lyrical fusion of violence and restoration. The women whose voices ring out across the pages are scavengers, housekeepers, soldiers, murderers, and wives. They bring together and split apart, folding laundry and offering human sacrifices for the sake of their own children. When author and activist Karen Forsha selected this book as the winner of the 2011 Bernard Women Poetry Prize, she called it poetry for the new century, awake to the world, spiritually profound and radiant with lyric intelligence. In an interview with Writer's Digest, Brimal called herself a hoarder when writing, constantly collecting images and pieces of language. While delving into her work, I found myself hoarding images of my own, cheeseburgers, rhinestones, katydids, carcasses, flowers. Her poetry fearlessly explores the, the macabre and uncomfortable, unflinchingly piercing previously unseen or unnoticed pieces of the human experience. For example, in her poem, Our Bodies Break Light, Brimal writes, one day, as we listen for water, we find a beekeeper. One eye pearled by a cataract, the other cut by his own hand, so that he might know both types of blindness. Here we notice that the beekeeper is blinded both by internal and external forces. 
He's afflicted both by the cataract and by himself. This exploration of interior and exterior violence invites a closer investigation of our own wounds and poses the question, which is worse, to be wounded by something else or to be wounded by yourself? The concluding line of the poem is, when you ask about resurrection, he says, how can you doubt? And shows you a deer licking salt from a lynched man's palm. This line forces our eyes to an image we would likely avoid otherwise. Once our focus is there, Bramall invites us to pause and contemplate the violent, oddly tranquil and paradoxical nature of a single scene. As a poem, I am reminded and astounded by the truth that can flow from the marriage of two wildly separate, dissimilar ideas. In another poem, Become the Lion, Bramall proclaims, we're always at the mercy of one menacing grace, one right, an art that makes us suffer twice. As writers, we know that to write is to suffer something twice, that to recollect, refine, and reiterate an experience or memory on a page is to live through it another time. When one reads Brimall's work, one is at the mercy of a menacing grace of a prolific and inventive poet with images so visceral that they must be constantly revisited and rethought. In this way, the reader feels the weight of Brimall's words, her right, her art, not merely twice, but a hundred times. On behalf of the Contemporary Writer Series Committee, I'm honored to introduce Tracy Brimall. Tracy, we are so grateful that you could join us this evening. And on that note, I'm honored to give the virtual floor over to Tracy Brimall. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jaden. That was such a beautiful introduction. I, I really appreciate all the time you spent reading those poems and thinking about how to introduce me and my work. Um, and thank you to Shelley Rotschafer and Dan Mancia for the invitation and Linda Foster for starting um, this series. And I'm grateful also for everyone else whose personal life algorithms have brought you to this for you page of this event tonight um, for an evening of poetry. And I'm gonna sneak in an essay too. Um, so tonight I'm gonna read from my newest book um, that was called uh, Come the Slumberless to the Land of Nod. It's also my background image. So that's kind of a super long title. So just to introduce kind of what, why. Um, the Land of Nod, uh, I grew up in a household that only had two forms of literature and that was the Bible and comic books. And um, in the Bible, um, I was very interested in Cain and Abel. Um, I, I reread Genesis a lot. I was meant to read the Bible all the way through and got stuck at Genesis every time. Um, but in there, when Cain kills his brother, Abel, he sent out to live in the Land of Nod in exile. And so to me, it was really interesting to think about this place of um, exile that already existed and had a name even before someone was sent there for murder. And there's also this um, little lullaby rhyme I knew growing up about Wink and Blinken and Nod, these three brothers um, who sail the, the night sky when they sleep. And so I sort of loved this connection of this uh, tie to both a uh, lullaby and murder ballad. Um, and I, I was also pregnant um, during my friend's uh, the trial for my friend's murderers. So of course I was thinking about bringing new life into the world and also sudden and painful death. Um, and my mom also uh, passed away a few months after my son was born. So it's like really at a point in my life where I was very torn between life and death in these very literal ways. Um, and so Nod was just this idea, this place, this thing that I circled around a lot. Even though I just mentioned super depressing stuff, um, I'm gonna start with a love poem. Um, we'll start at a bright spot. Um, and I guess the, the downer about this love poem is that it was secretly an elegy. I wrote it after a love was over um, and in sort of in memory of it. Um, but it was, I've always wanted to write a love poem and I always have thought that they are super mega hard um, because it's hard to every time you write one, you're just like, oh, I sound like an Ed Sheeran song, it's the worst. And it just feels like too sweet. It sounds like so saccharine, you're gonna give somebody a toothache. Um, and so I, one of the things that gave me permission to write this poem, um, well, one, I just like being rebellious and writing things I feel like I shouldn't or don't have permission to. And the other was this quote by Oscar Wilde who said, um, without exaggeration, there can be no love. And I think people who fall in love tend to be like, their, their eyes are the bluest blue that ever blew to blue um, because you're just in love with somebody. And so it's just, you see them in these very ridiculous ways, uh, but that's kind of how love does that to you. And that's kind of, it's kind of nice actually. So this is a love poem without a drop of hyperbole. I love you like ladybugs love windowsills, love you like sperm whales love squid. There's no depth I wouldn't follow you through. 
I love you like the pawns in chess love aristocratic horses. I'll throw myself in front of a bishop or a queen for you, even a sentient castle. My love is crazy like that. I like that sweet little hothouse mouth you have. I like to kiss you with tongue, with gusto, with socks still on. I love you like a vulture loves the careless deer at the roadside. I want to get all up in you. I love you like Isis loved Osiris, but her devotion came up a few inches short. I'll train my breath and learn to read sonar until I retrieved every lost blood vessel of you. I swear this love is ungodly, not an ounce of suffering in it. Like salmon and its upstream itch, I'll dodge grizzlies for you. Like hawks to skyscraper rooftops, I'll keep coming back, maddened, a little hopeless, embarrassingly in love. And that's why I'm on the couch, kissing pictures on my phone, instead of calling you in from the kitchen, where you were undoubtedly making dinner too spicy. But when you hold the spoon to my lips and ask if it's ready, I'll say it is, always, but never, there is never enough. Um, so I mentioned, you know, this idea of lullaby and murder ballad, and there are quite a few um, poems called lullaby in, um, throughout the book. Um, and then each, there are three short essays that appear and they're all murder ballads. Um, for whatever reason, the, the lullaby made sense as a weird lyrical poem and the murder ballads I needed to make more narrative and make more sense out of um, as I was writing them. So this poem is not explicitly a lullaby, but it is about my son um, who has been like such a great inspiration for poetry. Yesterday, he completed his first dandelion harvest and we made dandelion syrup. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to mix some in some gin um, and we are gonna make some sparkle water cocktails for him um, after it cools. But I just love the way a child introduces you to so much of the world again. And he's also a big fan of facts. And there are tons of things he wants to know the answers to that I don't have the answers to, but I think it's beautiful to wonder. Um, and so this poem is called, Oh Wonder. And I only ever meant for it to be a poem purely about the delight of wonder. But my writing group said, ooh, look at this line, you have to go deeper. And so even though you're starting out, some of you in your first creative writing classes or second creative writing classes, I've been doing this for literally decades and I still go back to my friends and say, hey, look at this poem and tell me what you think. Um, and I'm still looking for people to, to encourage me to write, to encourage me to be better. Um, and they, they help me keep me honest in life and in poems. So shout out to the friends that keep you writing. Oh, wonder. Wonder is the garden spider who eats her mistakes at the end of day so she can billow in the lung of night dangling from an insecure branch or caught on the coral spur of a dove's foot in sleep, her spinnerets trailing radials like ungathered hair. It's the million pound cumulus. It's the troposphere holding it, miraculous. It's a mammatus cloud rolling her weight through dusk, waiting to unhook and shake free the hail. Sometimes it's so ordinary it escapes your notice, a pothos reaching for windows, the ease of an avocado slipping its skin. A porcelain boy with lamp black eyes told me most mammals have the same average number of heartbeats in a lifetime, which is why the mouse's engine hums too hot to last and why the blue whale's slow electricity, six pumps per minute is the way to live centuries. I think it's also the hummingbird I saw in a video lifted off a cement floor by firefighters and fed sugar water until she was again a tempest. It wasn't when my mother lay on the garage floor and my brother tried to lift her while I tried to shout louder than her sobs, but it was her heart, a washable ink. It was her dark's genius, how it moaned slow enough to outlive her. It is the orca who pushes her dead calf a thousand miles before she drops it or it falls apart. And it is also when she plays with her pod the day after. It is the night my son tugs at his pajama collar and cries, the sad is so big I can't get it all out. And I behold him, astonished, his sadness as clean and abundant as spring, his thunder heart a marvel I refuse to invade with empathy. And outside, clouds groan like gods, a garden spider consumes her home. It's knowing she can weave it tomorrow between citrus leaves and earth. It's her chamberless heart cleaving the length of her body. It is lifting my son into my lap to witness the birth of his grieving. 
Um, so I'm going to read um, a, a short essay here in the middle. Um, it's only four pages. I mean, they're pretty small pages. Um, so the, the murder ballads appear throughout sort of during the process of both pregnancy and the murder trial. Um, and this is the last one that appears. Um, it's the murder ballad awaiting sentencing. Um, it's a lyric essay um, that's braided. So there, these different threads will come up about lullaby and about the trial and things and my son's sleep and stuff. And so I'll just sort of pause in between and just know there's a little section break symbol as I start to like collect these different things that seem separate but are somehow together. Murder ballad awaiting sentencing. On the day I bury my mother, I check the news for updates on my friend's murder trial. The last of my friend's three murderers is found guilty. The jury recommends death. The other two men have been sentenced to lethal injection. The judge has five weeks until sentencing. Five weeks to decide if this last man should live or die. The men who killed my friend spent three hours deciding whether to kill him. The problem of a robbery turned kidnapping solved in three hours in a deserted stretch by the freeway. Though perhaps they never debated at all. Perhaps they were only waiting for the right stretch of road, the right field, with grass tall enough to hide a body. My son can't sleep, or I should say my son can't sleep peacefully. He rolls and thrashes and wakes himself crying. I worry that it's nightmares, that he can tell something's wrong, can smell my dead mother on the sheets. In his essay on lullabies, Frederico Garcia Lorca claimed, the child comprehends much more than we think. He is an inescapable poetic world that neither rhetoric nor imagination nor fantasy can penetrate. A flat plain, its nerve center exposed of horror and keen beauty where a snow white horse falls suddenly injured with a swarm of bees furiously nailed to its eyes. But my internet searches assure me fitful rest is not the nightmarin, nightmarish lurking bees humming in his skull, but its common phenomenon in infants called sleep regression. He is suffering from difficulty adjusting to his sleep cycle and startles himself during light sleep. It's not the nightmares that are the problem. He can stay in those and stay asleep. It's when he drifts too close to wakefulness that he startles and cries. Advice columnists say I must wait it out, do what works to help him sleep. The only thing that soothes him is when I grab both his hands and mine and pin his body to my chest. Immobile, he can sleep. Restrained, he is peaceful. Instead of helping my sister plan our mother's funeral, I stay up in my mother's room with my son, bouncing, rocking, singing, trying to keep my voice monotonous and sweet, waiting song by song for his eyelids to drop and his breathing to slow. I try a version of a lullaby my mother taught me, always my arms full of his uneasy weight, my mother's old song, my voice off key, my son frightfully alive. His death was not a gentle one, the medical examiner tells the court. This is when I should have stopped reading the news report. It should have been enough to know the trial had finally ended. Soon, something resembling justice might be served, or the forgiveness I was waiting to feel would loosen my heart. Either way, at least it would be over. That knowledge should have sufficed, but I read on, needing to know. Did my imagination come close to the truth? Can the imagination ever accomplish that? I finally get my son to nap in a hammock by the pond. The ducks here in Florida have monstrous heads, red and knobbed, as if they've survived a scalding. Pushing the ground with my toe to keep us rocking, I scroll through the story, careful to keep my movement small. My sister is busy making a collage of photographs of my mother. My brother and his wife are on the front porch, keeping their griefs to themselves. I am hiding in an older death to keep from facing a new one. The medical examiner in my friend's case came out of retirement to examine what remained. His knowledge specialized, necessary. There's no rest for someone who knows what he knows. So when the remains were finally found, he looked at this young man's body in the advanced stages of decomposition to discover what he suffered and where. We order an autopsy for my mother. We do not know why she died. The weeks in and out of the ER, the vomiting, the weakness, the tests all inconclusive. By then we'd grown accustomed to the panic. The emergency room became routine send flowers, send a card, assume the mystery would leave her body again so she could come home. The afternoon she died, nurses told my brother she could probably be released that day. It was sunny, warm. I walked my son through a parking lot and thought, 
My mom is going to die soon, but the world seemed so indifferent, I couldn't imagine it was true. These are the details that I knew. Th that calmness, that assurance, those thoughtless robins, that bored sky. Then the seizure, then code blue, then my sister on the phone saying they lost her. And for a second, I think the nurses wheeled her into a hallway they've forgotten and need us to come down and search. We won't get the autopsy back for a month, but when we do, it contains the weight and color of her organs. Her body eased open, each part examined and replaced, each part perfect, except her heart. It gets better when I stop blaming myself. I tell myself it's not my job to get my son to sleep. It's his job to get himself to sleep. It's my job to make sure he knows he is loved and safe. It does get easier. It's just time. I whisper, I kiss, I cradle, I wait. Lorca, so full of promises, said, unlike us, the child possesses his creative faith intact and is still free as yet of the destructive seed of reason. He is so innocent and so wise. He understands more deeply than us the ineffable key to poetic substance. I try and imagine the lullaby my son would write if he could, something bloodless, something with milk and a mother's sweet sweat, something that ends with light and an instinct to drink from the body you are held to. Before the funeral, the pastor we hired says we must not make a spectacle of our grief. We must celebrate her life, limit the length of time we talk so that there's enough time for his sermon on Lazarus. Oh, I say a bad word. I'm really sorry. I apologize. And it's a bad, it's a mean thing. I'm sorry. I should have warned you. <laughs> Fuck these men of God, I think. I'm sorry. Talking about somebody pulled back from the brink of light, somebody who got to embrace his sisters again. What a terrible choice of material for a group of grievers, this man with his second chance. Heaven has never seemed more ridiculous. None of my sadness feels real, only my anger. My son cries and my husband takes him away so I can be by my mother before they close the casket. Her hands too stiff, her face too slack, her hair refusing to curl around her ear no matter how many times I push it there. Her pink sweater hiding the autopsy incisions the mortician's hands soothing the embalming fluid through her body, massaging her limbs to break the rigor mortis, to make sure the fluid runs all the way to her fingertips. The roses on her grave ache open for days. I try everything, lavender baby shampoo, mechanical heartbeats, a plastic turtle with constellations punched into his shell. I sing, I rock. I wait for the nights to pass, for my son's troubled sleep to turn restful and deep, but my son and I are awake for a new phase of the moon. So the sleep regression doesn't pass. Lorca makes new promises for a new kind of lullaby in which the mother and child go off and sleep together, that comforting unit of we. Danger is near, we must shrink, be small, so the walls of the little hut brush against our bodies. Lullaby one, lullaby two, naming the parts of his body to a melody. Two eyes, two ears, two lips, a nose, two arms, two legs, ten tiny little toes. Nightlight on, I read him stories featuring a cat, an owl, a runcible spoon, and one about a toadstool circle, a changeling, the woods lacking even the mercy of a wolf. The catalog of damage to my friend's body. Skull fracture, stab wounds, multiple repeated also in the skull, broken ribs, broken forearm, severed finger. Does it help to know that after a certain threshold, the body doesn't feel any more pain, my husband asks. At a certain point, the brain can't even process it. How could it help? To know that my friend's body was taken to a point where it could not have a chance to cry out, to broadcast the pain that swept him away so quickly. What kind of balm is that? And who does that soothe? I know nothing of that kind of pain, though when I scroll through headlines looking for solutions to my son's sleep, I find an article that says sleep deprivation is, quote, less overtly violent than cutting off someone's finger, but it can be far more damaging and painful if pushed to extremes, end quote. I try and imagine the nights with my son as if it was a walk into a dark field and all that could happen there, but it's not the same. Pain and pain plus fear are different kinds of suffering. Motherhood is pain plus joy. My sleeplessness is love plus delirium. All my pains these days are small ones, inconveniences, hangnail, headache, my tender gums bleeding on the white flesh of the apple. Cause of death, homicidal violence. The verdict, guilty. The judge returns, everyone rises. 
the third and last man who helped murder my friend waits with his head down, looking at his hands and listening. He is given life. Um, and so I'll close with um, a couple poems. Um, Um, this one is also a, a little bit sad or sorry guys, uh, but then I'll end on something um, a little bit happier um, to bring the mood back up before I leave. Um, we were talking about um, endings and difficulty with endings and I wish I could remember the name of the student that asked. I could scroll through some names and see if I could remember. Um, but one of the suggestions I had is taking something from a poem and putting it up top or if you're over explaining your ending, um, cut that. And so this is sort of my title is called Vive Vive, which is Latin for live, live. And it's sort of the answer to, to the image of the end. Um, so if you want to know, um, it works really well if you can see the poem um, and know the end, but in it, there's a commandment carved into a piece of fruit. Um, and that was the commandment, the answer is in the title. Sometimes I think the title can be a great way to answer something that remains unanswered in a poem. So for my friend who asked me out there, things about endings, that is, that is one of the ways I worked on this ending. Vive, vive. Last night, I slipped my finger in the milkweed, my hand doing the wind's work. It was so soft, that crooked slit aching open, but not far enough for those white tufts to float away. I couldn't help myself, and I didn't want to. I wanted to tease out those stubborn seeds and make them leave as they're meant to. Stupid little futures hiding from flight. A friend tells me she had a dream about me holding an armful of apples in a treeless field. Write a poem about it, she says. Call it come what may. I want to call it my joys are selfish whores and suck the worm from a red delicious. But wasn't I good once? Didn't I play penitent with the floral sheet bobby pinned to my girlish curls as I rocked the doll's plastic lips to my flat chest and called it the Lord's? What now? Lowly animal, I've pitied myself like any mammal that hurts. I've described the papier on a cat's tongue to my son, how that wet sandpaper that cleans our salty fingers is a predator's tenderness, the tongue evolving into a tool to lick bones clean. None of my prayers are questions anymore, just aching stanzas full of chrysanthemums dying on the kitchen table. At our anniversary dinner, my husband and I agreed we wouldn't talk about pain. No new medications, no dosages, no metaphors for what's failing in his body now or how this new pill will make him die for trying not to suffer. He had the pork. I had the balsamic glazed duck. There was apple torch and coffee at the end. The sun set. We said nothing. There was no language without sorrow in it, that terrible near symmetry. I set out my nativity two months early. I always confuse Joseph with the shepherds, but there's no mistaking Mary and her silent bear, baby staring up at bored sheep. I paint her robe with a nail polish called starter wife. My Lord, why is goodness so hard for me? I lick a battery to feel a spark before putting it in the toy ambulance. Dead, I think, my tongue unjolted. At least now I won't have to hear the sirens wailing their false emergencies after my son loads the swaddled baby Jesus in the back. My husband is in his room again, where he goes to be alone with his suffering. I think of my wedding, of the sky that day, the hope I had, the shame of it now. Our old cat paws at the back door, hissing at something beyond the gate, growling at what only he can see in the dark. I hiss at him. I want him to know danger is coming from both sides. You can't even trust what you love. He claws at the glass anyway, as if there were any fight left in him, as if this meanness isn't what we all do when we know how helpless we are. God, God, what do I do after all this survival? Another friend dreamed of me saying, I can't bear it anymore, and sprouting glass feathers from my shoulders and arms. She said the dream wasn't windy, but they fluttered as if they were, weren't glass. Even in dreams, I'm flightless, incapable of escaping. My prayers return as a knife and the commandment I carve in the skin of an apple, gentle with the flesh, gentler with the blade, before I suck the sweetness from each of the wounds I made. And the final poem to, not, to end on a non-downer um, is called Contender. Um, and um, 
there's a mention of the racehorse secretariat. I myself have never been to um, a racehorse competition. I know they serve mint juleps and wear big hats and the horses run really fast and people even bet on it. I've never been to one, um, but I do know the triple crown is a famous thing for winning three big horse races. I don't know what those are either, but secretariat, I do know because he was in an insurance commercial. Um, secretariat was this very famous racehorse who won the triple crown and um, the, if a horse wins the triple crown, they get the, the good luck of getting to be buried. <laughs> um, but they did, performed a necropsy on uh, him before his burial and discovered the secret to his success was an overly enlarged, genetically over enlarged heart. Um, and the, there is a quote that I'll shout, um, which really is what uh, the veterinarian performing the necropsy shouted um, upon opening up Secretariat's chest. Um, and it is also, it could be offensive, but I just think it's beautiful. Um, so this is called uh, Contender. And it's my last poem. And I really look forward to any questions you might have about um, the writing process or about this book or poetry in general. Um, I could try for life advice. Um, I'm not good at my own existential problems, but I can try for yours if you'd like. Um, but please feel free, I'm a Leo. <laughs> I'm born in the year of the dog. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. I'd love to hear from um, some of you who are hanging out and listening to poems tonight. Contender. It's all right to overdress for the riot. Your rage is stunning. It's all right to pursue the wrong pleasures and the right suffering. Here's my permission, take it. It's all right to replace the siren with a bell. Your emergency should make its music. It's all right that the meter reader broke your sunflower in half. You knew better than to plant it where you did. Sometimes it's all right if you call your waiter honey when you order sweet tea. It's all right if you fall out of love with being alive, but rise again tomorrow with French pop songs and fresh croissants. Wear all your gold to church and try, really try, to believe anything but a stethoscope can hear your heart's urgency. It's all right that your mother died. So will your father and your son, but hopefully not before you. It's all right to lay naked in the rain and refuse to go inside, even when the moon tries to make your cold thighs shine. It's okay to lick the ice cream cake from your fingers. Do it now in front of everyone. And if what falls on the children lining up their cars for the soapbox derby is not snow, but ash, that's all right. Celebrate the mutable body. And if you write notes to friends and senators in primary colors, that's fine. It's even okay to begrudge the stubborn pears in the wooden bowl. You're right, you know. They're waiting to yellow until you turn away. It's all right that in the economy of forgiveness, you keep coming up one daffodil short. It's all right if you ask your heart to grow the size of secretariats, not because you want to outrun other horses or because your legs are classic, but because you too want to be buried whole after someone examines the insensible engine you left behind. I am of the beloved's name, no longer metronoming the valves and places that slick fist in a stainless tray for weighing and shouts, sweet Jesus, before describing its ungodly heft with superlatives, your heart, the most tireless, wildest, wiliest, thirstiest heat on record. Thank you again for coming out tonight. I look forward to hearing your questions and hope you have some. If not, I can monologue, read another poem. I'm testing my mic. Here I am. I'm a Scorpio. So. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I saw today said dating Scorpios gets four out of five stars. So that seems pretty good. <laughs> I love it. Okay. This is a great question. It makes me think of like one of the most meaningful. I, I tell my students the story about attending a reading uh, from Laura Kashishka when I was a student at Hope College. And I still remember things that she said. It was a series similar to this. And that was when I kind of woke up, when I like stopped going to these events as like a like as a student, like, oh, I have to go to this. And I thought, wow, like <laughs> I'm not gonna miss another one of these, you know. Um, your poems about your son. So um this is a question um from a student who asks, How has your son changed the way you write or what you write about? And sorry, I should contextualize that the Laura Kashishka, she was writing about her babies at that point. So I, I remember her doing that. Anyways, the question's for you though, not for Laura, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, 
when I was uh, first writing, I had a really elaborate writing ritual and it took multiple hours and a half pot of coffee and it needed to be 3 a.m. and I needed to be sitting in this chair and I needed, and it was very elaborate, but it usually worked. I had this whole like whole thing. Um, but what I'm, I wasn't even dating someone at the point, but I was like, okay, but I can't, if I want to be a mom someday and I did, I know I can't, it's not going to work that I have to have four to five hours of quiet time to get a poem out of myself on a Saturday night. Also, you can tell my social life was really wild if that's how I was writing. <laughs> um, so obviously not dating anyone at that point. Um, but so then I just started to figure out like, well, what are other ways that I could write? And I limited myself to just the back of postcards and first drafts for a, a year. Um, and I just sent them all to a friend and I just experimented with like allowing myself to write different ways because yes, especially that first year, it took my kid till five before he slept through the night. It's, it was so many years, it was years. It wasn't months, it was years. I'm just like not sleeping and it was awful. Um, and it really was like, I'd have like an hour at a Starbucks to try and get something out of myself. I was like, get out, get out, get out, get out. Um, so a lot of poems in that book, I tried to read ones that I thought had more like narrative or sense that maybe you could follow by just by listening. But a lot of the poems called lullabies, they're freaking weird. They're totally bizarre. Um, they're, they're lyric and strange. And sometimes I did a lot of lists at the time too, because that's what I could get out of myself. Um, some nights I was like, he would only go down for short amounts of time. And I just like read by the nightlight in his room. And poems were about all I had the attention span for either because I was just so exhausted. Um, and he's a miracle, but also I just want to say that miracles like a very bloody <laughs> and exhausting. Um, and I love him and he's the best thing I've ever done in my whole life. And also, oh my God, um, I recommend waiting. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it just had to change. So of course I ended up writing some things about him. Um, and he has, has said beautiful things that show up in poems. Um, and also, but also now he's getting to an age, like that poem, A Wonder, that where I sort of confessed um, how big his sadness was. Um, that on another poem, I'm like, I think that's it. I don't think I get to take any more of his private interior because he's developing an interior life now, you know? It's not just, he just, just that he can't sleep or these cute little things he says as a munchkin, but like, I don't get to exploit his self, personhood, private stuff that he shares with me because we're the people we trust the most um, in a poem. So it's it's sort of an evolving question too, something I still think about, like how much of this can I use or say? So something adorable, like I'm absolutely going to put his dandelion harvest in a poem because that's just cute. Um, but there are lots of things that he shares with me that I know that's about me honoring who he is as a little human um, and keeping to myself and maybe sharing with a friend my concern, but as I'm having to redraw that poetry line. So how I wrote and what I wrote about changed and continues to change because my life does and he does. And I wanna, um, somebody told me recently that people are more important than poems. And I wanna think about that in terms of the relationships that are a big deal to me and that I wanna be careful with how I navigate them in the writing about them that I do. That's a great answer. Okay, um, I have a student who asked, how did you get the confidence to begin writing? Even through suffering and pain, you still continued. What drove you to continue? Gosh, maybe there's the fact that I was suffering. <laughs> you gotta put it somewhere. I don't have a lot of other coping mechanisms. <laughs> so it all ends up on the page. Um, and I think too, sometimes actually, the times I've suffered the most, it has been really hard to write. Um, it's been really hard to make something, but I also think I feel so much better when I do, um, when I get, when I make something, when I sit down and paint, when I bake a loaf of bread, when I make a poem, I think all sorts of forms of making are really important um, as a form of resilience, like we talked about. Um, but I also wanna say that one of my favorite lines of poetry comes from Lee Young Lee. And he said, what, what kept me alive keeps me from living. And sometimes I think our coping mechanisms can get um, between us and the world. And that I think that, you know, like, I think writing is a pretty healthy one. It doesn't do a lot of damage there, um, but we can have our ways of things that keep us going um, or, you know, get us to the next day that, that at some point, hopefully we can set those coping skills down. Um, for as far as confidence, I mentioned I was a Leo. So I think I was just born this way. Um, 
but also it, it isn't right the reason i'm a poet actually is because we were poor growing up and i didn't feel i really wanted to be a visual artist and i felt like it was too expensive to ask for that kind of money um i asked for music lessons and was told we couldn't afford it but poetry is all you need is the back of an envelope and a pencil like you don't need a lot to write a poem um and so it was so accessible and affordable um i worked in an art school but never took a class right um like i had all these interests and, and things but i didn't feel like i was worthy of that but a poem was small enough i wasn't taking up space i wasn't asking for money um so some of my my confidence just comes from cultivating that part of myself and feeling proud and actually i think what kind of helped is some jerks told me I was bad. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, you're wrong and you're mean and I don't like you. And kind of that stubbornness was my fuel of just, I wouldn't let somebody, some old cranky person shut me up. Um, because you do, I mean, you do get turned down when you submit your work and you get mean reviews sometimes, or, you know, those things happen. Um, but, but fortunately, I, I guess it's just me being stubborn is I'm not gonna let, if I stop writing, it's not gonna be because some stubborn jerk told me I was bad. Screw that guy, that person sucks. Um, but it will be because I'm done, not because somebody else told me I had to. So that's, that's part of my fuel too, is that um, it's part of how I stay awake. Um, and not just, obviously coffee is a huge part of how I stay awake, but the, you know, Gretchen, you too, you mentioned that thing like awake to the world or you hear something and you're like, what? Of like, th there's just, for me, when I'm paying attention or writing a poem, um, it, it just keeps me awake to myself in the world a little bit more. It can't be the only way I do that. I've got to also take my walks and live my life in other ways. It's not the only thing, um, but it makes me pay a different kind of attention. And I learn things about myself when I write. And I'm hoping that helps me be the person I want to be in the world. And hopefully that's a better person. Um, but yeah, so that's part of the confidence I think is practice. Um, people telling me to shut up and I said no. <laughs> um, and um, and also just kind of needing it a little bit. Um, Great. I'm feeling very inspired right now. Um, okay, so one student asked, um, at, made a statement and then asked a question. Almost everyone has passions in life. What was the thing that pushed you to turn your passion into a career? You've kind of alluded to it, but maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, you know, I I saw a post today too about like pursuing the privilege of being able to pursue passions. And so I will say like, I had the privilege of having a full ride to college. So I studied what I wanted. Um, I also then like had a, uh, told other people I, in class today, like I, then I got a regular job and I was working at a Shakespeare theater after I graduated college. and. Honestly, I was dead inside. I just remember it raining and I felt the rain walking home from work one day. And I was like, when was the last time I felt anything? And just crying and like, I've got to change my life. Um, and then one of the actors at the Shakespeare Theater used to work out would put books of poetry in my mailbox. And so I would read books of poetry while the plays went on. And um, I was just like, this is, this is it. I've always loved poetry. I'm gonna move to New York City. I'm gonna be a poet. Um, there's a corny quote by an, Anais Nin about um, one day the risk it takes to break into flower um, will be less than the risk it stay if to, of staying tight in a bud. But the of like that was the less risky thing for me. I didn't have dependents at that time. I didn't have an ailing parent I needed to take care of. So I could just throw it all away, quit the job, move to New York City. But I think you can be a poet in any way possible. But I also think making it a career, right? I did have some privileges, you know, my youth, I didn't have dependents. I had a full ride to college, so I wasn't like worried about some of these other things that I know worry other people about choosing that. Um, so I think there's elements of privilege in that situation, um, but also just, I couldn't, the risk of living the boring life laid out for me <laughs> seemed worse than throwing it all away and just trying to become the person I really longed to be. Um, and I do think some people don't have that privilege or, um, like I never asked for a loan from my parents or anything, but I did know if something happened, they would help me if something bad happened, right? So I think some people have a safety net and some people don't. So I would wanna say there's an amount of privilege in just saying, I'm gonna make art a career, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, like I also just, I couldn't live that, that life. I just needed to do anything but that. And so that's why I decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, Great. 
we're glad you're we're glad that's what you decided to do. Thank okay, you. so we have we have kind of one and a half more questions and then remind me, don't let me forget, I need to acknowledge someone very special to the series before okay. we finish. Okay. I cannot so the, how's that for a teaser? Everyone okay. today stick around at the end. Um so um Dr. Boudelier um, said, can you share out specifics related to your writing work group that you mentioned? Um, who's in it? You know, how and when it was formed? How often you work together? What platform do you use? Is it online, in person, that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I saw that question. I was excited about that one because yeah. I moved to central Kansas from um, Kalamazoo, Michigan. And y'all right down the road in Kalamazoo, they have like the dopest community. They have a, like a poetry festival going on this weekend. That's free, I think, pretty sure. I don't know, double check. Um, I used to run the like reading series at the um, Book Art Center where we'd make broadside of poets work. They have a spoken word community. They have multiple like groups that people, and like I went from this town that had all of this going on to this lovely place in central Kansas where I was like, where are the people at? Like, where are the writers? Like checking the library groups and checking. I couldn't find anything. I could find no writing group. And so, and I was like, stupid place, I hate it. Um, but then I was so lucky to get to be a part of a community where all of that stuff was already created. But like, isn't that the Dalai Lama said, be the change you wish to see in the world, right? So then I just had to create the community I wish to be a part of. And I think that's basically our task for our whole lives anyway, right? Of just like build the spaces, create the communities that you want to have. Um, so I started a poetry book club at my local used bookstore and people come to that, it's wild. <laughs> um, it stopped during COVID. We did a few online, but it just wasn't as robust. Um, and in my home, honestly, it was uh, other writing instructors and graduated my graduated grad students. Um, oh, and, and I graduated undergrad, but people who also just needed a community and like the push to, to write. And I just always have like a lot of sparkling water flavors and some wine and fancy cheeses. And we just cold read some poems or flash nonfiction or whatever that night. And we just do it once a month. Um, with COVID, we moved online. Um, I have sort of run out of steam a little bit from doing so much Zoom. Um, but as soon as people are sort of um, at their two weeks post second shot or their Johnson & Johnson or wherever they're at, um, I hope we can resume. But I just needed to, I wanted to live in a place where people valued this stuff. And so I needed to help create great audiences um, and great community members and great readers. And so I just like hold, hold that space. And it makes me write too. Like I haven't written for months. And then a friend was like, hey, let's send each other something. It's like, oh, my. and then I wrote a poem because a friend said, hey, I want you to do something. And I was like, okay. Um, so again, it's those friends that can keep you accountable when it feels like life is too stressful or I have laundry to fold or I have other things to do. And then they just keep you, keep you making art, keep you accountable to yourself. And I think it's really so good to, even if it's just a buddy, a friend, a long distance friend and not a whole group. And that's really great. But I think if you can find those other like-minded people and buy some nice cheese, um, it's really great to have those spaces um, that keep you committed. Um, and I will say it changes, like with the group, we've been together for a few years now. Some people have been coming consistently for like three years. Um, so we just talk about each other's work differently. It's not like sit silent in the cone. It's like, oh, so here's where I'm at. Or, oh my gosh, when you were doing that series about Midwestern saints and, you know, we can just connect the things that we're doing or just have conversations about our work where we know we're at because we know ourselves as writers. And it's just really great to sort of build that long-term relationship rather than just semester long relationships in workshop. And I recommend it. Every Monday at noon Eastern. That's my my writing group. <laughs> um, sometimes other days too, but that's my standing appointment. That's um, really okay, a lighter hearted question for you. Um, what's your go to coffee order? Ooh, I love that. Okay, mm -hmm. so if it's summer, it's the affogato. Um, which is a scoop of gelato with espresso poured over it. It's so good. And often they'll give you just a tiny spoon to eat it. It's beautiful. It's your dessert and your coffee in one. Um, honest, but like at home, it's just really boring. It's just drip coffee. I don't even do fancy pour overs or French press. My French press is for camping. <laughs> so I get really good coffee when I go camping. Um, but yeah, I just do really boring drip coffee, but I just really love a hot cup of coffee and reading in the morning. That's how I always start my days with coffee in a book. And a question from Dr. Mancia, do you miss Water Street? I do. 
I miss everything about Kalamazoo. I really think it's just one of the coolest towns. I don't know if it, other people are like, mm -mm, it's a great no city. I have a Western grid so cool. too. Yeah, it's great. There's so much good, good food and it was still manageable size, but there was still a lot going on. Um, I, I miss it. This is, I'm, I like my life just fine. Um, but I, I thought Kalamazoo was a really super cool town and I liked living there. We have time for one more short question if anyone has one. Okay, so I'll yeah, give you, <laughs> oh, did, did something pop up in the chat or nope. can I get a writing prompt? Nope. Okay, all right. So um, if, if it works for you, the, um, in my book, um, I didn't read any of these tonight, but there's these series of poems called uh, Dear Eros and Dear Thanatos. And I always say, um, my, my Thanatos were always just like, when I, my poetry tinder of like, I was in, when I write books, I tend to be in serious contemplation with a set of ideas long-term, but occasionally I would just want to be at Water Street writing something. And I would um, meet up with a friend and I would write Dear Thanatos and whatever what came out was weird and dark and bizarre, but Thanatos is the death drive in people, that self-destructive drive. And whenever I addressed the darkness inside me, it showed up with something to say. Um, and I really just thought that it was, it was my, you know, poetry tinder, just like, white, right swipe, let's check this one out and go on a date with this poem that I didn't mean to go anywhere, that I didn't mean to get serious with. But as I was getting closer to finishing the book, I was like, you know what? I think those Thanatos poems belong. <laughs> but then I realized I should write to Eros as well. So I was like, okay, that's what my darkness had to say. What does my love drive, my life drive have to say to me? And when I wrote to Eros, they were long, they were chatty. Um, the tone and diction were totally different. Um, and so my, my prompt is that you should write a letter to an abstraction. And you could make them like dueling abstractions could be interesting or dear grief, right? Um, dear uh, shame <laughs> or dear, so some emotion, some idea, dear freedom, dear, what is the, the thing um, that you think might answer you if you wrote to it? Um, and so that, that often is, is, has been a productive exercise because usually anytime I start off with the epistolary style, the letter, um, something shows up. So if you, um, think about, you know, dear history, um, dear whatever, what's a big idea or emotion? And if you wrote to it, what well, might it say back to you? Well, I think trying the opposite that, then is fun, you know? Oh, yeah. That's a great, thank you for that prompt. Julie Bevins, the Writing Center Director, and I will often tag team each other with poems. So I think Julie and I have our next assignment. So that's awesome. great. Awesome, perfect. Um, I want to um, acknowledge Nalana Laframboise, um, who has been the Contemporary Writers Series student representative for this academic year. She has done a phenomenal job in getting information out to Contemporary Writers Series um, participants and uh, instructors who are using our um, CWS author's work in their courses. Um, she's taken exceptional notes and gone on errands and done all sorts of amazing things. So Nalana, we, we applaud you for your amazing work um, this year and wish you all the best as you um, continue on in your own writing life. And we know that you'll do amazing things um, and maybe we'll see you on this series someday. Wouldn't that be amazing if we did? So, <laughs> um, and um, just want to tell all of you to stay tuned uh, to the Contemporary Writers Series uh, um, social media pages regarding our fall season. We have a great lineup for the 2021-22 season. Um, we'll be kicking off with two young adult authors in the fall, uh, Randy Ribe and Matt Mendez. And um, really excited about those authors as well as the other authors that will be um, heading to campus next year. So, um, so make sure that you, uh, that you check our page for updates. And um, Tracy, it has been an honor and a privilege um, to listen to you. I could have listened to you for another hour um, but I think it's such a gift that I had a chance to spend this hour 
with you, learning from you and just reveling in your words. So thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. And stay safe and healthy, everyone. <laughs> yeah, things look rocky in Michigan. Thank you, thank you, Tracy. Of course, thanks for starting the series. I wish I was in Michigan. <laughs>